This presentation is called, What is an Ultimate Question? So Ant 105 is about evolution and human behavior. And as we've noted, that combination of words can mean many different things in different contexts. So we're trying to spell out what is it that we mean when we're talking about evolution and human behavior. What is Ant 105 all about? So here's one answer to that question. And that is that Anthropology 105 is about ultimate explanations of human behavior. And that statement raises two questions. First, what is an ultimate explanation? So you're going to hear that word ultimate a lot in behavioral ecology. What does it mean when we talk about ultimate explanations? And second, are other explanations possible or interesting or important? The answer to that second question is a definite yes. There are other kinds of explanations. And these are often labeled proximate explanations. So we have another question here. Uh, what is the difference between an ultimate explanation and a proximate explanation? Now one point to make at the start here is that I tend interchangeably to move between question and explanation and cause. And there's not too much significance to that in terms of understanding the contrast between proximate and ultimate. So we can talk about proximate questions, proximate explanations, and proximate causes. And similarly, we can talk about ultimate questions and ultimate explanations or answers to those questions based on ultimate causes. This distinction in evolutionary biology goes back to a paper uh, written by Ernst Mayer in 1961. And the paper is called Cause and Effect in Biology. And this is the paper that introduces the use of the terms ultimate and proximate. And the point of the paper and its focus is to explain or discuss how causality in biology differs from physics. It had long been argued that living things are simply different because they're created. And this was often discussed in terms of what's called teleology, which suggests that for life there is a grand design and a purpose. And Mayer's argument is that this is not the difference. So he argues we can indeed give mechanistic explanations of biology in terms of biochemistry. But the real difference here is not teleology, but rather the fact that biological causation is much more complex than the kinds of relations studied by physicists. Part of that complexity indeed has to do with what teleology was about, and that's the problem of purpose. So Aristotle discussed this, and he noted that our, our anatomy and behavior appears to be designed for a purpose, and this seems to hold for living things generally. And he referred to this as a special kind of cause or explanation that he called final cause explanations. So if you utilize a final cause explanation, you explain something in terms of its purpose or design. And Mayer's point in this paper was that biology can explain those purposes and designs in two ways. So there are two biological explanations that help us make sense from a scientific perspective of the appearance of design and purpose in living things. And the first of these is 
the product of what Mayer called functional biology. And this is the kind of biology most of us learn in high school and the first year of college. And this kind of biology deals with how it works questions. For example, a functional biologist might be interested in the question, how do mutations occur in the code of DNA? And a variety of mechanisms have been identified. You can have a substitution where one nucleotide is substituted for another. In this case, adenine has been substituted for guanine. So the G has become an A. You can also have insertions where an additional nucleotide is inserted into the code. And in this example, adenine has been inserted. And you can also have deletions. And in this example, what's been deleted is the guanine. So there's other ways that mutations can occur, but those are examples of a functional explanation of how mutations happen. Evolutionary biology, on the other hand, asks questions about why it works like that. So an evolutionary question might be, why do mutations occur in DNA at the rate that we observe? Why aren't there more mutations typically, or why aren't there none at all? And the argument from an evolutionary perspective would be that that rate of mutation was optimal or had an adaptive advantage. So if you have no mutations in DNA ever, Obviously, evolution couldn't occur, and presumably organisms that did have mutations were able to develop new kinds of variation that had an adaptive advantage. On the other hand, if you had too many mutations, probably the organism wouldn't be viable. So from an evolutionary perspective, you can start to think about the question, of why mutations occur at the rate that they do. And this is rather different than simply describing how they work. Now you can get too hung up on this distinction between how questions and why questions, and it's not always that clear that this makes sense of the distinction between functional and evolutionary biology. So not all how questions are functional biological questions. For example, we could say, how does natural selection shape adaptations? Um, that's very much an evolutionary question, even though it begins with the word how. And similarly, not all why questions are evolutionary questions. We could pose the question, why do I feel good when I'm around babies? And we could answer that using functional biology, or we could answer it using evolutionary biology. And we're going to look at that example shortly. So the key to the whole thing is not just the distinction between the word how and the word why. The key is the distinction between functional biology and evolutionary biology. Now the terms that Mayer used for this were proximate and ultimate. So functional biology is all about providing proximate explanations to answers to proximate questions and identifying proximate causes. An example would be how do our hearts circulate blood to our brains and intestines? That's a proximate question that functional biology can answer. Ultimate questions are questions that have to do with evolutionary biology. And the same holds for ultimate causes and explanations. So an ultimate question might be, why did natural selection favor the evolution of larger brains and smaller intestines in humans? And that's the case, as we'll discuss later in the course, Compared to other primates, humans have a larger than expected brain and smaller than expected intestinal tracts. The illustration that Ernst Mayer used 
is a famous one and it has to do with a warbler. So a yellow warbler is a small uh, songbird. And while Mayer was writing this essay, he was observing this warbler on his deck in Massachusetts. And after August 25th, it no longer came around. So he assumed it had flown south for the winter. So he points out using this example that we can talk about proximate causes for why the warbler flew south on August 25th. And part of the answer would have to do with the ability of the bird to sense the length of the day, to pay attention to the temperature and the direction of the winds. And then on August 25th, these cues in the environment came into alignment and the warbler left. So we could give functional biological explanations of how the warbler was able to sense the length of the day, temperature, and direction of the wind. The ultimate causes would be that if the warbler had stayed, it probably would starve to death uh, as the winter came on and its food supply, which is eating insects, declined. So here the explanation would be that over generations, the ancestors of this warbler were selected on and selection favored those who left before the winter arrived. Now an example related to humans comes from page 169 of Sarah Hurdy's book, Mothers and Others. And here she notes that men as well as women are physiologically altered by exposure to babies. So this is really interesting. You pick up a baby and you hold it and your physiology changes. Uh, the proximate reason for that is that hormone called prolactin rises in, in your blood and this changes your behavioral response. Uh, you become more nurturing and this happens to both men and women. Although prolactin levels increase more in women than men, uh, the more that men hold babies, the more prolactin they release and the more caring and nurturing they become. Now, functional biology can explain how that happens by looking at this hormone, prolactin, and how different levels of prolactin uh, affect our behavior. Uh, whereas evolutionary biology can explain why it happens. And presumably, this is because individuals who had that response to prolactin when they held babies had higher reproductive success in the past. So the functional biology provides a proximate explanation of how human physiology is altered by holding babies, whereas evolutionary biology provides an ultimate explanation about why that happens in the first place. And this principle holds generally, and this is the easiest way to get an initial handle on this. You want to connect the word proximate to question and answers that are based on functional biology, and the word ultimate to questions and answers that are based on evolutionary biology. And of course, ideally, we want full accounts on both hands, but we don't always have those. But Mayer's key point was that each approach can be pursued independently and provides distinct kinds of perspectives on what we're observing. So in descriptive biology, as it's often taught, ultimate evolutionary questions usually come last and often hardly at all. And if we visualize this, as a pyramid, the base of the pyramid and what you learn about biology would be proximate anatomy and physiology. And then way up at the top, you might get to those ultimate evolutionary explanations, um, but that often isn't given nearly as much emphasis as it might. So in this class, ultimate questions are fundamental we're going to spend a lot of time on evolutionary explanations of human behavior and much less time on proximate biology. And asking ultimate questions does change how we think about ourselves and our biology. An example of this is how we understand our development and the patterns of development that humans exhibit. And in an evolutionary perspective, this is called life history theory. 
and life history theory is about why the patterns of development that we see have evolved. And in humans, this involves for human females an extended post-reproductive life. So this distinguishes us as a derived feature from other primates. And we also see in humans long childhood dependency. And an evolutionary perspective might lead us to ask how these might be related together. And there's a hypothesis on that that's called the grandmother hypothesis that argues that the extended post-reproductive life of women enables them to mother as grandmothers their grandchildren and increase their survival. And this might be linked then to the long childhood dependency that's evolved in humans. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.